Hello everyone, good morning. <laughs> um, welcome to this webinar about severing the service designer. Um, I will just start the presentation. And here we go. Right, so yeah, hi, I'm Milan. Um, I'm going to present this little story today about Severin Service Designer. Um, I'm one of the two presidents of the Intersection Group. We um, are a not-for-profit association um, with the goal to help people create better enterprises. Um, so I call myself actually an enterprise designer uh, and some other people I noticed started doing that too. Um, and just uh, to give you a little background, uh, so this is what we do. As I said, we are not-for-profit. We are based in Vienna, Austria. I'm actually based in Paris. Um, and we are working on a toolkit for doing enterprise design, so designing better enterprises. We are working on community uh, projects and events like the Intersection Conference series. Um, and we publish uh, trainings, books, publications, content, and so on. Um, and today's story is basically uh, quite close to um, things that I have witnessed myself in my work, um, coming from user experience and service design and moving into uh, changing organizations and enterprises to deliver good services and products and experiences. Um, and uh, so our fictional character today, Severn, will use uh, some of the components of the toolkit, will use some of the patterns um, that uh, a part of the book and uh, might actually, if they exist, uh, present at our conference. Um, so just uh, one clarification, when I say service design, um, I mean the design of services. Um, and I put here a quote from Lou Down, uh, they were presenting at our conference in 2016, so this is actually them presenting in Copenhagen. Um, it's a very good book called good services and just you know because sometimes the, the term leads to confusion so I'm not talking about uh, you know services in the sense of service, service level agreements in ITIL or web services like making machines talk to each other even though those things might of course be part of any kind of solution uh, to implement a service uh, but I'm actually talking about designing a good service uh, like think of the post office or a um, as we will use actually today, um, the case of a uh, railway service. So let's dive right into the story. This is chapter one uh, called A New Playing Field. It started in March this year. Um, and this is Severin. Uh, Severin is a senior service designer. Uh, they, are, they have a lead role in a, in a consultancy. Um, Actually, uh, probably it has been a independent design studio that has been acquired by some big business consultancy, happened a lot lately. Um, and this is basically what they say about themselves. Um, especially, they like to think that they make things happen because of an unstoppable drive to make sense of any mess. Um, because what we find ourselves in when designing services is often it is a lot of mess. Um, Lou actually in the same presentation um, said that uh, it's 90% archaeology, so we have to find out why a service exists, who is it for, what makes it drive, what the people have to do, what kind of technical assets, and so on and so on, and rearrange all of these elements in a way that it makes sense. Um, this is uh, actually um, coming from a typical job description from one of those agencies, um, so roles or, or responsibilities like map out journeys, concepts, processes, own those deliverables, um, work with UX designers, UI designers. Actually, if there are no UX and UI designers around, do that themselves. Um, use qualitative research, but also other methods, uh, run design thinking workshops with clients and so on. Um, and one day, Severin got a briefing uh, from one of their customers uh, called Intersection Railways, which is our fictional railway company that we use uh, for most of our examples. Um, and you see uh, on the phone, it's like a huge email 
uh, and it said stuff like, we need you to support and leverage the ongoing, uh, well, support us and leverage the ongoing trans uh, digital transformation of its efforts in our group, uh, design new services based on a digital platform, uh, deliver something that is innovative and uh, creates an outstanding customer experience. And yeah, you know, uh, their eyes glazed over reading this. Uh, I've read these kind of briefs a lot, <laughs> uh, boring. Um, but then they had a conversation with the marketing director uh, and they said something very interesting that maybe um, was in the email, but just as a side note, because often these briefings, uh, they um, concentrate on something very tactical, like some kind of part within a project, within a program, deliver something like the digital platform or something. Um, but what they said here is actually, actually our strategy is reintroducing night trains across Europe beating the competition, beating the other railway companies, but also uh, like sector competition like um, airlines or people who prefer to, to go by car um, or by bus. They know that they say that top-notch customer experience is key for this. And they said, OK, you are on board here because we need a new app. We need something that is as cool and uh, um, works as well for customers as something like and like think Apple would make Apple Eye Train. Okay, fair enough. Uh, probably not Apple Eye Train, but Seven starts dreaming of uh, night trains. Uh, and this is just a picture from the initial research from the Venice Simplon Orient Express. Can be quite fancy. Can be can be quite cool. So what if we made something like this app saying Paris tonight? Book your bed. So some learnings here from chapter one. Um, Service and UX design engagements are often quite limited in uh, their brief, uh, talking about an app or a certain part of a service, not uh, uh, the, the whole thing. Um, they have a limited scope. Um, but looking at this from a human-centric perspective, like as a passenger, as someone traveling with this, what would it feel like, uh, can help you develop a personal vision, a personal enterprise vision, where you see the future of the enterprise and what you can do to, to um, help them get there. So that was chapter one. Um, Severin is excited, uh, starts the project, and wants to come up with a bold vision. And the first thing they did is um, ask the client for, what have you done so far on this? They have done a lot. Uh, so the client sends all sorts of stuff. Uh, there are journey maps, uh, there's the, um, uh, structure of the existing uh, iPhone app or Android app. Uh, there are personas that they uh, created. There are um, business and and analytics statistics and so on. And so there's a lot of existing knowledge. Um, it's actually normally quite difficult to find uh, what's relevant of all of the stuff that uh, has been done already in an enterprise. But there is a lot of existing wisdom hidden in these kind of things. But one thing uh, every designer, I guess, should do, and Severin does, is actually take a night train to see how it how it's like. So that's what they do. Um, here's at the station, on the train. It's not as fancy as in the vision. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a fun journey. Uh, they talk to a lot of customers. Um, and what the customers say is things like, well, it's, it's um, it's an interesting offer. It's nice, uh, especially for budget travelers. Um, it's uh, it's not incredibly comfortable, and the the app actually doesn't. Um, uh, thank you, Wolfgang, for this comment. Actually, <laughs> the train is from Finland. Um, anyway, so the current app is not about travel times. And by the way, please um, please ask any questions and and uh, comments in your chat in the chat. Uh, so the current app, they say, the this passenger says, it's just about travel times, like when to get from where to where. It doesn't actually say about the journey, anything like what kind of um, features this night train might have. It's just not part of the scope of the app. Um, and uh, someone else says, yeah, I actually would like a meal. Uh, is, is there something like a breakfast? Um, and then they also talked to frontline employees and they said, yeah, well, you know, nice vision, uh, Orient Express, but, you know, our equipment is actually quite old um, and uh, signage systems are in bad shape. So people actually don't find 
the right things like uh, the right compartments. Um, this needs to be addressed first before you look at any kind of digital stuff. Fair enough. Um, Severin goes back with these insights with his team into design thinking workshops and uh, yeah, shares what has happened, shares a lot of the research, where qualitative research insights. Um, the team gets quite creative, especially from his agency. Um, the, the client team is also quite engaged, even though sometimes people like seem to look at all the stuff and, and they, they just look very skeptical. They don't know, uh, they, they don't say much. Uh, and Severin's like, mm, what's going on there? Well, maybe they just, you know, they're not very creative because it's this business people or something. Um, okay, uh, let's continue. Um, it goes on making a blueprint, a service blueprint, mapping out uh, the customer journey, mapping out the different channels of customer interaction, uh, the touch points um, and uh, the, the customer goals at each of the stages. And then also starting to map what happens at the backstage, right? What does uh, intersection railway have to do? Uh, what do maybe some other actors have to do? Uh, like like um, station operators um, or uh, booking portals that appear in the customer's journey. And uh, so chapter two concludes also with a quite happy point. In the design thinking workshop, they actually got to a prototype. You can see it here. It's a an app uh, that says uh, night train. You know, it's, you see that maybe there has not been yet a great effort uh, spent on the visual design of that. But um, for example, you want to go, we are in Copenhagen and it says, okay, you can be in nine hours in Berlin, in 16 hours in Vienna, in um, 16 hours in Paris. So one of the ideas maybe was to inspire people where to go. Um, and yeah, to conclude this chapter, um, a lot of wisdom might be hiding in existing repositories, in data, in documents, in things that already have been done. Uh, but nothing actually replaces the first-hand experience of trying that service yourself, experiencing the interaction with the enterprise, uh, wearing their shoes, their, them being, in this case, uh, the passengers or the customers. Um, and service blueprints can actually help, and, and other conceptual models, like we will see in a bit, can help um, make sense, actually, of the mess and uh, uh, explore everything that needs to be in place in order to deliver something like a service or an experience. So all going well, everyone is happy. Chapter three, um, know thy customer. So to, having done all the research and all the co-creation, uh, Severin actually thinks that they know the customer in the sense of intersection railway and the team, but also the customer in the sense of the passengers and the potential uh, prospects of such a service that today wouldn't actually book uh, um, this kind of train or train ride. Um, and they have a meeting with something called the Customer Experience Board. Uh, it's a body that uh, Intersection Railway has since some time. They take care of things like the voice of the customer initiative, uh, look at improvements and so on. And you see, they all look quite happy, but it is, uh, as you might know, when you are, have been in these kind of meetings, can be quite deceiving. <laughs> so what they are saying is actually also um, reflecting what already transpired a little bit during the design thinking workshop, there's a lot of skepticism about this. Uh, some senior leader says, I thought this was an, about an app. Um, so all those new services that you mapped, uh, she actually calls it services, um, because there's multiple things that have to be in place, like making breakfast, uh, guiding people, uh, kind of, you know, almost turning the train into a hotel. Um, are those in scope? I, I thought this was a digital project. I thought this was an app and HR in the uh, top right corner says, we will have to retrain all our staff to deliver this kind of stuff. Who pays for that? Is that in scope? Uh, FMB says, uh, we, we can't actually right now deliver meals to specific passengers. All we have is a tray going through the, the train. Is that okay? Um, and, and customer service said, uh, like kind of the opposite of, um, you know, what, what uh, the senior leader says, um, you, you talk to them, but only about an app in the interviews. You keep coming back to the app and also in the ideation. Um, isn't this, isn't an experience design about the whole ride, like literally the whole train ride and how you go through all of this? Um, 
And well, yeah, they have a point. <laughs> but I think the big bummer actually comes from the strategic planning guy saying, we cannot actually support so many new routes. Uh, initially, it will be just two or three. OK. Um, next thing that happened in this story. Um, so right now, we have been working for a team called Digital Channels, um, part of marketing and communication, uh, part of a shared services team in the org chart. Um, there's also in the IT team something called digital development, and they are supposed to then develop that uh, digital service based on the platform that has been in the brief. Um, so after the meeting and after uh, maybe some weeks of uh, problematic discussions, in the section railways decides to do a reorganization, say all of what marketing does here is actually too far away from actual development. Let's merge those two teams. Let's uh, create one team called digital and IT, and it actually replaces the, or it, it's, it's basically, it comes under the provision of the existing IT department, which means there's a new boss, which is Chris, the CIO. Um, and you might remember these characters from the last story that Wolfgang told um, one week ago, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, so Chris basically in the first meeting says, well, basically the bottom part of your blueprint is not actually reflecting anything where that's actually going on. It's just some fantasy that you came up with in the design thinking workshop of what you know the backend back processes might be, but you didn't actually look at our process model. This is not our real business process. Our platform capabilities just don't actually support the stuff that you uh, prototype there. Um, but you know, no problem. Um, you might have to do it again. But uh, you know, uh, I will send. I will have someone send you the actual requirements that have been developed. Um, and is this actually aligned with our annual plan? And and who is responsible here for delivering what? And um, do you actually have evidence? Which of these things that you put in there matter the most to our customers? Tough questions. He also brings um, Ernestine, an enterprise architect, uh, who uh, seems quite cool, you know, wears a sunglass. Um, and uh, yeah, is also in the meeting, is rather quiet, but um, we will meet her again later. Um, and yeah, so looking at the requirements, looking at the uh, documentation of this digital platform, um, it gets quite complex quite quickly. Uh, delivering railway services in the IT infrastructure, in the physical infrastructure, um, is quite complex. Um, they send over diagrams like this to show how the service actually works. Um, and uh, even zooming out, it gets quite complex. There's European level regulation. There are different countries with different regulations, despite efforts to harmonize. There's a vision on how to use IoT, satellites, all sorts of technologies in these kind of uh, new services. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the whole vision gets uh, challenged by uh, a lot of these things. and. Um, I think many designers in the room know that feeling like when you have an ambitious goal, you have an ambitious um, vision uh, and it's actually shared uh, amongst part of the client team, but then the enterprise reality kind of comes in and rains on your parade. Um, so yeah, what about this initial vision of uh, you know reinventing night trains, bringing uh, the, the comfort of other modes of travel, hotel and plane, for example, to something that is more sustainable um, and shifting basically people travel in Europe. Um, so Severin gets quite disenchanted by these developments, um, trying to make sense of all the mess, uh, you know, uh, thinking of a lot of things um, that, that came up, um, like the things <laughs> mentioned there that he's thinking, uh, that they are thinking about right now delivery models, information flows, uh, strategic visions, um, technical things, architecture, standards, and so on. Um, and there's an email from Ernestine um, who they met earlier um, saying, let's have a coffee. And by the way, if you want to watch the story of Ernestine, there's a link and we will share the slides later. So during their coffee, uh, Ernestine actually um, gives uh, 
Severin a book recommendation, which is uh, a big classic uh, in management. It's Simon Sinek's Start With Why, um, and says, you know, maybe you have been focusing too much on what that service actually should look like. And now everyone is like, uh, well, how do we deliver this? Can we actually do this? But we haven't looked so much into the why. Uh, so we have to kind of get the conversation going on how, how, well, from what we deliver to how we can get there to um, why are we actually doing this and what are the priorities? Um, and uh, she shows them this model, which is part of our intersection toolkit. Um, it's called the enterprise design facets, um, which is a way we chunk um, thoughts and concepts and um, uh, ideas about an enterprise and where it is today and where it might go um, into these distinct um, circles. So the identity being, why do we exist? Who are we? Um, what matters to us? Like, why do we want to get on this night train journey? And then the experience being, what is the role we actually play in people's lives? And the architecture being, um, how do we actually get there? How do we operate? Um, how do we manage to, to do, uh, to deliver on that ambition and to um, actually deliver great experiences to customers, but maybe also to other actors in the ecosystem? And then we have the intersections uh, where you have basically these big questions overlap, uh, like um, uh, how do we organize ourselves in order to deliver on our ambition? How do we get people and, and the architecture uh, um, together? How do we appear in people's lives as with our brands and with our products? And how do we deliver these products? And how does our brand reflect our identity? Um, and uh, she shows them also this model, which is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the conversation gets more and more geeky. Um, and uh, so uh, Ernestine calls this a meta model. Um, so basically it's a bunch of stuff that you might want to look at and model and map out when you uh, want to shift enterprises. Um, so Severin says, okay, I will read this later. Um, says, thank you very much. And uh, downloads all the stuff and starts reading. Um, and one model um, that Ernestine uh, showed them is also this one um, that she has been working on, uh, on a lot. Um, it's called a capability map. It's a collection of everything that the enterprise can do or, or if it's a future state one should be able uh, to do. Um, and it kind of resembles the org chart. Uh, but she's quite insistent that it isn't. Uh, you can implement these capabilities, she says, in different ways in the org chart. One can be actually implemented twice or, or three times. Um, the, it's more of a collection of, um, yeah, really, like what what do we be able, what do we need to be able to do? Uh, what are the intended um, uh, things that we can pull off as an enterprise, basically? Uh, and Severin immediately thinks, well, this could actually inform. Uh, on a much higher level without looking into all these detailed processes that the other people send over, like the bottom part of my blueprint, like how can I actually deliver this kind of stuff, um, these kind of experiences. So some conclusions for chapter three. Um, an enterprise is made of, of ecosystems. Uh, there are external ecosystems like markets, uh, including uh, the customer or the commercial market um, where our train company finds passengers and, and customers that book the service, um, but also well, other external markets like the job market or the finance market, but it also consists of an internal ecosystem, which is the organization, the assets, uh, the operations. Um, and these uh, uh, lines sometimes get very blurry, especially in services that depend a lot on other actors uh, to operate. Um, so, Experience and service design naturally focuses on those external ecosystems. So what do our customers actually want and actually need? Um, and um, through this understanding enables us to design better products and services and ultimately experiences. But a lot of opportunities, but also showstoppers for delivering these experiences might be hiding in the other elements um, that are traditionally out of scope for service design, interaction design, UX design. Um, 
And so we have to shift focus and refocus uh, in order to actually address this. Chapter four, the enterprise on a napkin. Um, having read all this stuff, um, Severin goes a few weeks later um, and discovers something called um, the Milky Way map. Um, and it start, the story starts with uh, this idea of the enterprise on a napkin. So basically taking a, uh, a napkin, literally, as you see here, and looking at, okay, um, what do we actually do for customers? Um, how do we do that? And why are we doing it at all? And this, as you may remember, um, kind of maps to the facet model that we are using, um, what being the customer experience, so how we appear as an enterprise in other people's journeys and help them uh, achieve the tasks or solve the tasks. Um, why are we doing this? And uh, so what's our ambition? What's our vision? What's the story behind our enterprise uh, that is shared amongst uh, everyone delivering it? And uh, how do we do that? What do we have to get into place? What are the capabilities, the processes, the assets we have to put into place in order to deliver that? Um, and uh, so uh, the simplified sketch several does of this <clears throat> uh, map looks like this. Uh, so you have basically uh, something called a geography um, where we get from the left of uh, making and sourcing everything in order to get our enterprise ready to deliver to the very right where we actually deliver and then learn from what has happened. Um, and we have the top where we go very operational, we deliver um, value to our customers um, and the very bottom where we go back and we reflect and we strategize and we change things before the cycle goes again. It's an endless cycle. Um, it goes in, in loops um, and you have in the middle of the cycle very close to us, basically our ambition, our identity, our purpose. Um, we have at the outside how we appear in other people's lives, especially the customer, but you might also map other actors and their experience outside uh, in red. Um, and we have our architecture, our capabilities, bridging those two and um, using this uh, scenario, using these steps as a way to connect those in context over time. Um, so this map, um, we use it actually a lot in our practice. And uh, so Severin discovers this map and kind of thinks, well, Ernestine says I should start with why, but maybe I'm actually better, like, who am I as, an, as a service designer to now uh, go and question the board? What's your vision? Uh, what's uh, the, the uh, purpose behind all of this? Um, because they, th they still think that, well, some of them think I'm working on an app and some of them think I'm working on a service, like an isolated service. So, or product maybe, if you want to call that, which is our night trains. Um, so how should I get started? And the, the thing that I actually know about based on my research and based on everything that happened so far is the outside. It's uh, what our customers want. So let's find out what are the tasks that customers actually um, want us to solve for them, or you could say the jobs to be done. Um, so it, they, they do something called a top task identification, um, which is basically a survey collecting all the potential tasks that customers might want to do uh, with the help of this enterprise, um, putting them all together in a big list and asking in a survey uh, a significant number of people, something like uh, 300 to 600, um, when traveling on a night train, what matters the most to you? And the pattern that emerges again and again from this technique is that there are very few tasks, in this case four, that are the top tasks. And if we get those tasks right, they got 25% of the vote, um, the customer experience will be significantly better than if we don't. Um, so times and routes, book a ticket, get on the train on time, plan with friends. is much more important than pets, sharing with friends, city guides, blogs, borders, and visa. These might be tasks that are important for some people, um, but uh, um, yeah. They, they didn't get so much for of the vote. So this this technique gives you a very, very clear sense of priority. And if you remember, uh, Chris actually asked, do we have evidence that the stuff that we prioritized in the service design is actually what matters to customers? So here it is, here's the evidence. Um, mapping that out in, um, in a Milky Way map with an experience focus looks like this. So we map the journey 
we met the customer stages going from research and planning to um, actually well, with friends, as it turned out, really important uh, to actually uh, planning the route, uh, buying a ticket, getting to the station, getting on board and so on. Um, and uh, we used the capability map uh, from the architecture team to actually look at what, what are the capabilities that would deliver any kind of product that serve these tasks. Um, like, for example, recommended trips might be a feature of our product that depends on the recommendation engine capability, um, which is, a you know, some people might say uh, not the right way to frame this capability, but uh, it's what people call it. It's the recommendation engine, so that's why it's in here <laughs> like this. Um, and what is the top task that is being served by this? Trip ideas, for example. Um, and uh, in the middle, we put uh, across this value chain, why, like, what, what, what is the purpose that we want to serve? What is our ambition as intersection railways with this? Uh, bringing people together, enabling seamless mobility. You know, you don't want to wait in the cold when you arrive or before you, you get, um, get going, uh, things like that. Um, uh, ultimate safety levels, of course, um, something that is always important in this industry. Um, and uh, well, Seven basically starts talking to people using this map, saying, okay, does this make sense to you? Uh, do you know who delivers this capability? Is this actually aligned with our strategy? Um, and uh, what are your ideas? Um, and so concluding uh, chapter four, uh, kind of a reboot of our uh, service design effort. Um, and on the left, you actually see a, an, an actual Milky Way uh, from, from Annika Kleiber, who invented this technique. Um, where you can see it can look quite differently if you render it with uh, each capability with an icon. Um, so qualitative research gives you deep insight into customers' lives um, and uh, can, can reveal hidden motivations, opportunities uh, for businesses to act. But quantitative research, like our top task identification, um, will gives you evidence on what is actually matters for the masses. <laughs> what are the priorities to, um, uh, to put into, for example, your backlogs and everything. And a visual geography and language of the elements, like in this case, capabilities and tasks and purposes, um, can uh, help you have the right conversations. And we think that every map that we make, including capability maps, journey maps, blueprints, or Milky Way maps, is only as good as the conversations that they enable. Um, and so it's this shared understanding that is accessible, not just uh, in terms of accessing it on, I don't know, SharePoint or at the wall, but accessible visually and in, a, as a narrative, as a story, uh, as a scenario um, to various people uh, who come from different backgrounds and have different perspectives, but they are critical to delivering that great experience that you envision as a service designer or as an experienced designer. Our last chapter, chapter five. Um, so you remember Severin really wants to make things happen and make sense of, uh, of every mess. So of course, all these developments kind of delayed the project. Um, so this happens about four, four months in, uh, four months later than originally planned with the deadline. Uh, but because everyone was kind of confused and not sure what we're actually supposed to do, um, this wasn't actually, uh, you know, considered so much of a problem. Um, so the architecture team actually um, co-created together with Severin and team um, this map, which is more of a of an architecture focus, but uh, follows the same geography. Um, so we have all the capabilities that serve different tasks in red on the outside. Um, and inside those capabilities, we have the actual IT systems um, and the, the information flows between them that we can actually look at. Um, do we have that data, that real-time data in that moment uh, when we want to deliver it? Where is it coming from? Where, where is it stored? Who is responsible for that system? Um, can we actually make that change within our budget, within our plans? Uh, can we put that into the backlog and so on? Um, so using this, uh, and you know, these models get quite messy as you use them. But if we want, for example, for our little travel app, um, serve that task to get to the station, 
uh, in a way that you don't wait in the code and you find the right um, uh, carriage immediately. And maybe you want geolocalization or IoT for this, um, like for the check-in or something. Um, yeah, where is this data coming from? Um, and uh, can we actually deliver it in that time? Uh, you see there, there are processes mapped in here. So um, where, where is it coming from? Uh, there's also the journey mapped. Um, so we, we can basically look at the dynamics rather than just the, the structure looking at this map uh, using time as a common denominator between something like a business process and a customer journey. Because we ultimately think um, that these kind of frames on what's going on in and around the enterprise are just different perspectives, different lenses different, uh, on the same things. Uh, so you can reframe, for example, a, a customer journey as a set of business processes that run in parallel. Um, and uh, all of this sparked also a discussion on, OK, what do we actually want? So with the senior uh, leadership team, um, Severin actually manages to pull off a series of workshops to clarify that and produce an um, identity focus Milky Way map, um, where we actually look at, OK, what are the goals uh, for each of these stages um, and how are they interconnected? Which goal depends on which other goal and where should we put our priority? What should guide us as we make these decisions? Um, and all of that is part of a greater uh, process. Um, and, uh, you know, there are lots of models like these. This is our model uh, from the intersection group called the intersection loop. We basically say, um, any kind of initiative to deliver something like a new product or service or change something significant in the enterprise for someone like customers or employees or investors or other people um, involves going through this. Like you have to invest into that change. You have to look at everything that matters, which is where the facet model comes in. You have to explore what's going on and co-design what you want to do, where you want to go. And then you have to transform what already exists um, through realization and uh, produce things that other people can reuse, like maps, uh, templates, leaving the blanks for them to fill, uh, giving people tools to do their job better rather than trying to do everything yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, this maps more or less to things like the double diamond, triple diamond, design sprint, uh, design thinking, um, all sorts of processes. But the point that we want to make here is it is a, a continuous co-design process. And we need to integrate those two sides, the, the um, innovation exploration part that sometimes is done by digital teams or innovation teams and the transformation, realization, development part, change part that is sometimes done by transformation architecture uh, or development teams, which is kind of what happened in our reorg. And so conclude, to conclude chapter five, um, it is worthwhile to go out uh, of your comfort zone. Um, and I know that for uh, many people that is kind of scary, you know, you don't want to mess with IT systems, you don't want to mess with politics, with uh, strategy, um, but it is worthwhile. And um, it is a very good way to be bold there, to spark the right conversations. All other people can do is basically say, no, that's not right, let me correct that. And there the important thing is to, to um, leave the blanks, uh, focus on what you know best first, like in our case, we know the customer, we know the, the experience, we know the tasks. Um, and we all contribute to the single cycle of change. Um, and I put two pictures there that are actually coming from reality. In the background, you see a New York Times article about Austrian railways, who actually want to reconquer, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right word, to um, reintroduce uh, night trains across Europe and challenge the big um, uh, airlines and other modes of transport. Um, they actually uh, bought a lot of uh, trains and routes from other providers. Um, and the other one is from a startup who actually want to reinvent this from an experience point of view. And there you see what this train ride might look like on your app. Um, and now it's time for breakfast. Um, and this, this experience that is outlined there actually for the customer looks quite different from um, the current experience with the current apps, the current trains, the current rooms that you can book and so on. Um, and so, yeah, this, this stuff is actually happening. We don't know if it is one of the big railway operators or a startup or both who will deliver. Um, but uh, 
the point is that um, as a service designer, um, what we need to do is balance this bold ambition with what we actually can do and venture into um, what needs to change in the enterprise that is supposed to deliver all of this um, in order to get there. So you have maybe noticed all those little drawings. Um, these are illustrations by um, one of our core members, uh, Jean-Sébastien Daigle, um, which are part of the Enterprise Design Patterns book. And they talk about patterns that we found when doing enterprise design work, like um, developing your personal enterprise vision, hinting, not telling other people what to do, uh, especially when you enter their domain, um, wearing customers' shoes, focusing, shifting, refocusing as you go, and making maps and, and things that uh, depict shared understanding. Um, this is almost it uh, before we can jump into the questions. Um, just a few more uh, plugs next week. Um, actually, not next week, in two weeks. Sorry, <laughs> it's wrong. Uh, there is another webinar on the language that we are using uh, for modeling enterprises uh, together with Wolfgang. Um, so if you want to uh, know more about how to make these different maps and how to connect them all in one model, uh, join us there on 10th of November at the same time. Um, and we are running a training uh, over five days um, in November. Uh, it's suited for European, uh, Asian, Australian time zones. Uh, so only a few hours in our morning here. Um, and if you're interested in that, sign up for that. Um, and that's it so far. Um, as I said, I will share the slides with everyone afterwards and we can look at some of your questions. All right. So there are lots of questions. Do you have such trains in Portugal, Andre? Okay, you can uh, um, <laughs> answer that later. Um, so how does service design fit in business architecture scope? Can you relate it with capabilities and value chain? So I would say the answer is yes, um, you can. Uh, business architecture for now, for some reason, has, uh, in, in my experience, kind of a blind spot when it comes to customer experience and uh, service um, product and experience design. It's often like in the models a little bit outside of the scope, which is maybe due to the uh, where, where the discipline comes from. So I think uh, this is something to be overcome. And I think this is something that, that we are um, that, that's part of our mission, actually. Um, having this mixed group of designers, architects, change agents, organization designers, and so on. Um, how does this service fit with other services that the train line operates? Daytime services, uh, how does it interlink with partners, train track signaling operations, and so on? Question from Naomi, um, who's actually from an organization design background. Very good question. For this case study, we didn't dive into this, <laughs> to be honest. Um, this is exactly something to be figured out as we do our maps, as we do our, like, I, I guess these are kind of constraints. Good thing is that night trains run at night, so it might be a little bit less of a problem. Um, this is not a question, Wolfgang. <laughs> This or we already had, is this part of business architecture? Yeah, yeah I think uh, it should be. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Right, let me find an actual question. Here we have one. Rather long one, so I will read it. Any suggestions how to keep the raw data, qualitative and quantitative research evidence visible when going more strategic and abstract on the models? In my limited experience, the gap between vision, brand identity, and the implementation, UX, and processes tends to increase if the raw data is not traceable, in your opinion. So that's a very good one. Um, actually, there's a problem in uh, service and product design, which is um, if 
if it is a kind of a modern approach, there's a lot of upfront investment into research, um, like talking to customers, immersion, uh, like we did, um, looking into quantitative data, doing surveys, um, and shadowing probes and so on. Um, and then like this is often done actually by a research team. If we enlarge the scope and we say, um, as we really think we should do, um, and we say it's not only the market, the customer, uh, the external ecosystem, but it's also the internal ecosystem or the delivery ecosystem, which might actually include external actors like the supply chain. Um, we, we get actually a lot more there. We get we also have to research what are the existing capabilities, what are the business processes that matter, where are constraints in the IT landscape, in the physical assets that we are using, um, in the in the skills and the the way people do uh, their jobs, roles, and so on. So it, it, these these kind of um, research insights get uh, very large, both in the sense of quantity, but also in the sense of um, things you might want to look at and they get overwhelming quite quickly. Um, and then often there is a gap between people that are responsible for this kind of research part and people that are responsible for, you could say, the design or the architecture part. Um, and I've often seen that they actually design something that has no clear link <laughs> with the insights that have been gathered in the research. Um, so two ways to go about this. Um, one is, um, as you said, traceability. So um, what we try to do is make the research insights accessible in a way that is very synthesized um, and then enable uh, with a very strong prioritization, specific insights, specific data points can be qualitative or quantitative. Um, to be connected all along the journey from as is analysis models to to be uh, what it should be kind of models and those that illustrate the gap. Um, this is quite difficult, uh, especially given you know what I just outlined, but it is possible. Um, there, very, in very very practical terms, um, what we like to do is use a shared wiki. Um, Sometimes enterprises already have something in place, like uh, I don't know, Confluence or SharePoint or something, um, where we actually kind of manually put in all of this stuff together with guides to them. Um, and uh, the other way that we are working about this is uh, working on is actually to get everyone use the same platform for modeling and mapping, um, including things like insights uh, and as is analysis. Um, can be done through a series of shared uh, whiteboard-like models or today in something like Miro Mural. Um, or we are also exploring using architecture repository tools to actually have a semantic model behind and make those links. Um, but this is still a little bit in its infancy. Um, and uh, if you're interested in this, you're very much um, invited to join us on that journey. Um, a capability is intentionally designed, is an intentionally designed assembly of people and assets to produce an output. That's one definition. Um, is there anything missing? I think this is more of a question for the audience, uh, not for me. Um, Joao asks, does the Milky Way map cover all your services at the same time, or can it seen as a viewpoint for a specific subset? So the goal of the map is to have one shared geography for everything that's going on in the enterprise. Um, usually we cannot depict the entire enterprise, right? Like every model is actually a um, uh, just a subset, just a, um, a filtered view because the reality is much much too rich and too complex to actually be, be depicted on one 2D map. That said, um, the map, if used over time, and as you have seen in the in the real one, the real example uh, from Annika's work, can get quite extensive, quite complex, and quite big. Uh, it, it could actually resemble something like a, a you know, a where's Waldo kind of picture of everything that's going on in the enterprise. Um, 
And the context, well, the, the idea is not to limit the scope of the map itself, of the geography, to one specific service or process, to, but to keep it on, on the enterprise level and rather filter what we depict on the map. Uh, similar as you would do uh, with a geographical map, if you you know um, depict, for example, um, a stretch of land, and you decide, okay, should we should we include one road or all roads? Should we include trees? Should we include elevation? Should we include bodies of water? Um, with the goal to actually show these elements in context, and um, the, this context, depending on your challenge, uh, actually kind of helps you. Uh, decide what to include and how to depict it on this map. But the idea is that you do not share the geography. The geography is the same for um, for the enterprise. Um, yeah, uh, and so, yeah, I would really see it more as a, a analogous to uh, geographical maps. So it's, it's, you know, north is always up and south is always down. In the same way, we have always uh, the cycle in the middle, which is really more of a scenario um, to, to help us position things in context. It's not actually um, a hierarchical map where we say everything is a subset of this particular element. Um, Peter, how should service design education be changed so they can be even more productive partners in co-designing services across the other layers? That's a good one. Um, so, I, I kind of like you know so um, we have you know we have Naomi here uh, who who wrote uh, the book including the upcoming edition of Organization Design, uh, the Economist Guide and um, Andy Poulain who I um, included uh, you know in the in the references for the Service Blueprint because it's my favorite book on service blueprinting and and one of my favorite books on service design so um, he basically says. Um, service design is organization design, right? Um, and I kind of agree, you know, because uh, so, so basically that means that Naomi's book and, uh, and his book, Andy's book, talk about the same thing, but they don't, right? So one talks about going from a human-centric perspective from the customer back to um, what should happen on the inside of the enterprise. And the, what what should happen on the inside, or also on the outside, with partners and so on, um, is uh, mentioned but not extensively treated in the book, which is maybe this gap, you know, that also uh, people talking about business architecture here uh, might notice. So there's a huge body of knowledge um, on organization design uh, that I guess needs to be better reincorporated um, in service design education without turning them into complete, you know, um, people that, that only do that, only work with HR and leadership to, to do a reorganization or mergers. Um, and um, <clears throat> I uh, see a big gap in service design education, which is exactly the, the stuff that is covered by business architecture. It's often not even on the radar of people. Uh, but if you think about our service here, what are the capabilities that deliver the night train? It's, of course, people working together and making decisions and things like that. But, you know, in order for you to actually get to the right compartment on time, order your breakfast, get the right one, um, be able to send it back if it's the wrong one, get another one delivered, um, you know, uh, that things like that the train arrives on time. These are things that depend as much on people as they do on uh, technology and information flowing and operations. So I would say the operating model, the, the, the architecture of the capabilities and how they are um, implemented in things like IT systems, interoperability between different parts of these automated components is crucial for service design. But it's like it's it's kind of um, like either completely neglected or if it is part of UX design, then it's kind of relegated to the developers um, who have this other kind of uh, mindset that they're just waiting for the requirements or the stories to fall from the, the business or the client uh, in a Scrum team. 
Um, so I think this needs to change. It needs to change in terms of um, the scope being appreciated, the true scope of delivering a service and an experience from an enterprise and um, what what parts to look at. Um, and over the like if if this is being uh, the case, it might be that they want to call themselves business architects, organization designers, or enterprise designers. Um, and that's fine with us. <laughs> All right. Is this approach sector independent? Um, how would it translate to government sectors, which are very complex? Um, it's a very good one. We actually have a lot of government uh, people, both in my consultancy practice and also in our um, association. Um, and I think the short answer is it does fit. Uh, you can do it, but you have to be mindful of a few more things, unfortunately. Um, like, yeah, a citizen is something else than a, than a customer. Uh, uh, even though you can frame them like for a given service, you maybe have a customer. Uh, like if you want to get your driver's license, you are basically the customer of the government service. But if you look at the government as an enterprise, like if you look at a, even a um, local administration, um, they do all sorts of things, right? Um, housing and uh, security and uh, uh, licenses and, um, you know, yeah, all sorts of things, planning. And um, so um, in there, uh, mapping out the geography of the Milky Way is more challenging because it's not this one, like it's not as easy as, a, as it is for a commercial entity where you have basically, ah, we, we make a strategy, we think, we, we um, find out what people want, we make a product, we market it, we deliver it, um, and we learn and we do it again. Um, and so what we have, what, what happens there is sometimes we need multiple maps and one very, very abstract one that holds them together. Um, uh, there is a version uh, of the Milky Way where we put different stakeholders around and uh, usually you can have you, you can map out one scenario that connects them loosely right so you need security in order to deliver healthcare um and uh map multiple journeys like we need more colors in the red <laughs> uh so that we can say okay this is actually a top task um for for this kind of citizen or this kind of role rather this kind of actor um rather than that kind of uh, actor, but it might actually be the same person wearing different hats at different points of their life. Um, Pascal asks, isn't a politician someone who forgets being also a citizen? Yes, uh, that's exactly, you know, and this is why I think the human centric perspective is important when doing enterprise design uh, and enterprise and business architecture. And um, so coming back to Peter's question, I think um, even more missing than the architecture education from service design um, is the design education <laughs> from architecture. So um, yeah, I think uh, as, as these services get planned and architected and implemented, um, it, it needs to actually transpire to the uh, highest level that ultimately we are doing this for people and not for the government, which is why, you know, we had in, invited Lou down um, and, and thankfully she said yes at the time to talk about how the UK government did that. Um, and I know that right now, maybe they, they haven't been as far, especially with non-transactional services um, as they would like to be, but there, there has been this very famous speech in parliament where, um, um yeah one of the members basically said it, it has been too long that the services the public services have been designed around the the needs of the government rather than the needs of the citizens um and yeah now we just shared um the scottish government approach to service design which is i think a uh, landmark in this uh in this whole thing so i invite you all to look at that um and uh well that's it for today Thank you so much for uh, joining and um, be sure to join us in two weeks for the webinar on the edgy language. Um, if you have any more questions uh, in the 
um, slides that we are going to share at the very end, you will find an invite to our Slack community. Please join and continue the conversation there. Um, and yeah, see you next time. <laughs>